The David Pakman Show at davidpakman.com. Welcome to the show. A ton of great stuff to talk to you about today. A few things to get out of the way. Number one, we are now on Free Speech TV daily, uh, 2 a.m. Eastern Time and 5 a.m. Eastern Time, if you're up late or get up early, and then 11 p.m. on the West Coast as well as 2 a.m. on the West Coast every single day. Awesome to be on Free Speech TV, Lewis. Long time in the making now to, to get on uh, daily, and it's, it's happening. It's all happening. Good job at making that happen. Thank you. Also, we are looking for interns, both local and distance, for the upcoming fall semester. So if you're, looking, uh, if you're interested in interning on The David Pakman Show, both production and marketing tracks are available. Please contact us through the website, davidpakman.com. Click on Contact Us. Uh, let's get right into it. The, uh, since the religious right likes to say that weather events are, of course, signs from God, we saw this with Katrina, we saw this with the hurricanes in the Midwest. We've been thinking about it, seeing it time after time. Of course, the right wing realizes that Hurricane Isaac is a sign that God doesn't like Republicans and doesn't want the Republican National Convention to happen. There's no other explanation. Maybe that's just uh, how God parties. Fox News, by the way, is assuring us that this time it's just weather. It has no meaning absolutely of any kind. Of course not. Um, Isaac roughly does translate the, the meaning of Isaac is uh, God is laughing or God laughs. So that's, uh, that, that's interesting, I must say. Yeah, it's, it is an interesting coincidence. Now, because Isaac is a name that is associated with several men of African heritage, the Republicans are blaming the entire hurricane on President Obama. Somehow he must be behind it because he's Muslim. Now, of course, being Muslim has absolutely nothing to do with being of African heritage, but that's not stopping the right wing from, from blaming this on that. Or being a rain caller of some sort. I blame the gays, personally. That's really who I think is behind this. Always... Behind what? I don't know. But it seems that that's a common thing on the right. You just blame gay people. Yeah, well, there's, there's an agenda there. There's a mafia and there's a, a worldwide plot against uh, humanity. Your marriage is falling apart? It's because of, it's because of gay people getting married. Obviously, that uh, gay people getting married in Massachusetts affects straight weddings in Missouri. Everybody knows that. Yeah. Come on. Common knowledge. We don't even need to bring it up. I'm sure the Republicans will turn it around, though, and say that God wants the Republicans to win and God is testing their resolve by sending this hurricane. Hmm. Maybe he's just text, uh, testing the structural integrity of the buildings where the RNC is being held. All joking aside, if this were happening with the Democratic convention, you can be sure that there would be countless right-wingers, including Pat Robertson, including who knows who else, saying, you know what? God doesn't like Democrats. This is a sign from God. But they're skipping that since it's, uh, since it's the Republican convention. Here's an idea. Do not have your convention in southern Florida. Uh, well, not, it's not really southern Florida. In Florida, in the south, during hurricane season. There, there How about that? That's an idea. I think that's a really good idea. Of course, we have the one-day delay. The, comp the uh, convention's going to be compressed. Here's something interesting. Seven birthers speaking at the Republican convention. <laughs> of course, birtherism is just on the fringes. It has no part in the mainstream Republican Party. They would never give anybody like that any kind of a platform. Oh, wait a second. Donald Trump might be speaking. We all know about that one. He's the most connected to Romney, saying president wasn't born in the U.S. Let's see his birth certificate. Let's see the long form. Let's see the real long form once we see the fake long form, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Donald Trump. And there's this whole list. Actress Janine Turner. Did you know that she was, uh, she's part of the Kenyan born meme? I don't know who that is. Excellent. Georgia Attorney General Sam Olins, former Arkansas Governor Mike Huckabee, Florida Governor Rick Scott, Congresswoman Kathy McMorris Rogers from Washington, Louisiana Governor Bobby Jindal, we know him, he's perfectly sane. Uh, this is more like the birther ball than the Republican National Convention, don't you think? Really one and the same. You, you don't see it as any different? No. I mean, I just assume the vast majority of the people at this convention and speaking at this convention at one point were somehow entwined in the birther scandal. <laughs> you think that there's just no difference, just it bound to, to be intertwined there? Yes. All right, let's check in with our correspondent on the ground in Tampa, Luke Vargas from Washington. Louisiana so we'll be bringing Governor you coverage Jindal. of the RNC throughout the All right, week. let's start. Let's, let's get this reset up, Lewis, because we're having yeah. any number of issues I think here. you we, just need to learn how to use your computer. No, me using my computer would be a great thing. Let's check in with our correspondent on the ground, Luke Vargas Lewis, please. Okay. 
So we'll be bringing you coverage of the RNC throughout the week. Today it is uh, basically just going to be a uh, in-name only type of day over there. And we're going to check in with our correspondent on the ground, Luke Vargas from Talk Radio News Service. He seems to be near the Google central area, which, oh, as he moves back, I can see that it is handicap accessible. There is a ramp there leading up to it. Luke, what's going on down in Tampa? Okay, well, uh, here in Tampa, we've had a few days of darkness and rain, and finally, the, actually, the sun is breaking through here. Everyone thought they'd have to basically have a washout the whole week, but things are taking a turn for the better here. Okay, so now, of course, I'm sure that it's being discussed there, since Republicans very quick to say that uh, Hurricane Katrina was a sign from God, and, of course, the, the, the tornadoes were a sign from God. Clearly, the threat of Hurricane Isaac also must be a sign from God that God is angry with the RNC. Was that at the top of the list of today's briefing? Yeah, there was a briefing this morning, and the room was packed full of reporters who I think were trying to get some new information about how the schedule might change, if, if certain speakers might be swapped on, this, on given nights. And uh, one of the spokespersons for the convention came out and said there are going to be three main topics we're discussing at this meeting. The first was the storm, and he essentially said, uh, we're going to have a three-day convention instead of a four-day convention. A few speakers will be switched, but we're planning on going forward uh, as was discussed yesterday on Sunday evening. And the other two topics were a lot, um, a lot less important. They talked about how inside the convention center at the forum here, there's going to be two different debt clocks. One, which is the standard one you see behind Mitt Romney during his campaign events that shows the total uh, United States national debt. And the, and the other one will be a new debt clock that begins to count upward uh, as soon as the convention is uh, convened. And I would presume that Mitt Romney, when he's giving his uh, keynote speech, will point over to the screen and say, uh, look at the rate of uh, the debt accumulating, and isn't that a terrible thing? And yeah, now I'm sure in the interests of fairness, right next to that, there will be a clock which will show if, if George W. Bush was still president and we had his rate of debt acceleration, here's how much it would have accelerated during, during this speech. But of course, I think they're probably not going to have that. I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't bet on it. And, and the final topic they talked about was that this fancy television screen that is going to be behind the podium on the stage, uh, which is supposedly inspired by Frank Lloyd Wright, they're going to do a, a special 10-minute presentation that showcases all the incredible technological feats and tricks it can do. So uh, not, not very pressing things. I think people were nor uh, pretty much going there just to hear about the storm news, and they got a whole bunch of extra stuff. All right. So admittedly, things getting started a little bit slowly today. But uh, we'll check in with you tomorrow. Luke Vargas, Talk Radio News Service, are one of our correspondents on the ground in Tampa at the Republican National Convention. Uh, I hope there's enough guns there to keep you safe, Luke. I am worried about you. Yeah, I'll watch out. The NRA is just upstairs. <laughs> okay, sounds good. We'll talk to you tomorrow, Luke. Take care. Speaking of birthers, it turns out that Mitt Romney himself is actually now making birther jokes. It's kind of weird because you would think if you've been able to uh, avoid the uh, birther controversy, and kind of stay out of the way of it. You wouldn't go out of your way and make birther jokes, but he is. Uh, Lewis, you have what Mitt Romney uh, tried, uh, did say about a birth certificate. Let's take a yeah. listen to it. Now, I love being home in this place where Ann and I were raised, where both of us were born. Ann was born at Henry Ford Hospital. I was born at Harper Hospital. No one's ever asked to see my birth certificate. They know that this is the place that we were born and raised. Yeah. To be honest, I'd like to see Mitt Romney's birth certificate. It might be kept in a safety deposit box at a bank in Switzerland or something. So logistically, it might be tough to actually get it. But I'd love to take a look at it. I hear it was stitched together with hundred dollar bills and, <laughs> and bordered with uh, with gold. Romney is embracing the most extreme ele element of the conservative movement by, by joking about the birther stuff. And I get it. It's just a joke. And Rush Limbaugh will say, oh, it's just a joke and blah, blah, blah. Or he'll like it. I think Rush Limbaugh did like it. But let's be honest. This is the fringe element of the Republican Party, which is now mainstream. As I said just minutes ago, seven, at least seven birthers, seven relatively notable birthers are speaking at the Republican National Convention. And the primary, the, the, the nominee, the de facto nominee of the Republican Party, joking about birther stuff. Next, what are we going to have? A video of him saying, I have never been pulled over driving while black. It has never happened to me, I assure you, uh, Republican voter. How far is this going to go? Um, I mean, it is something we joke about, but is Mitt Romney doing this to instill some doubt in, in people's minds? I mean, it's, is he keeping it going? Or is it just a harmless joke? It can't be not 
planned. That's, that's my idea. This can't just be an accident. Where he says, well, there's no discussion. Maybe I'll just mention birth. I'll allude to birth or stuff. Maybe I won't. It's, everything is discussed. And there has to have been a decision made that it's not a bad thing for the campaign to just kind of joke about this. Keep it in the background. Keep it there. Foment yeah. it a little bit. I mean, I suppose even just acknowledging that that the issue is is still an issue is kind of bad. But it is. I don't know. I, I, I'm still not 100% convinced that this wasn't just a dumb joke. Natan, are you uh, convinced it was or wasn't a dumb joke? I mean, I, I agree with you, Dave, that uh, everything is planned in a campaign, especially with someone like Romney, who is so unnatural in his <laughs> delivery. It needs to be planned. Yeah, let's be so, honest. When's the last time Mitt Romney naturally made any kind of remark of any kind, right. and it was even remotely funny or got it was any about kind of... a, It was about a donut, and he couldn't identify it. <laughs> that wasn't a joke. He wasn't making a joke. That was. That's what happens, I guess, when he's unscripted. Yeah, he ends <laughs> up not being able to identify the most basic of pastries, ladies and gentlemen. Just, yeah. That's just sad. Okay, Monday. Time for a book recommendation. Book recommendations, of course, made possible in part by a fashion of bastards. Lewis, are you reading it yet? Uh, not yet, no. I it, haven't picked up a book in a couple of years. It's Joanna Louise Johnson's best-selling satire about the bizarre world of Washington's power players and their outrageous misuse of America's most precious natural resources. It's on Amazon.com. Here's my recommendation. I just finished this last week. Uh, the City and the City by China Meville. Now, the first book I read uh, by China was I, I, I was gr it was well written, but I didn't love it. it. The topic didn't speak to me as much. The City and the City is a fantastic book. I, I picked it up a couple months ago, finally read it, finished it a few days ago. The concept is that there's two countries, which are basically cities. They're city-states. And they have areas which actually uh, are shared physically. So in other words, they're two, politically, they're two different countries, but they are actually existing in part in the same space. However, because of the conflict and the tension between the two countries, people who are in one country wear clothes of a certain color, and people who are in the other country, remember, it's the same physical space, wear clothes of another color. And you are basically taught from when you're very young to identify who is not in your country politically, even though, again, same, they're sharing the same space, different buildings on the same block, for example. And you, the term used in the book is you unsee them. In other words, you really kind of, re, you look over them. You, you don't acknowledge them. The cars, for example, in one of the cities are far newer than in the other. So people, as they, as they, as they grow, um, they, uh, they learn to realize which cars they shouldn't even really be taking notice of because they're not even in the country they are. That's kind of the context for the book. And the book is really kind of a crime story. Awesome. Very, very entertaining. I highly recommend it. It does sound pretty good. It's very, very good. Yeah. The City and the City by China Meville. I highly recommend it. On today's bonus show, we've got a great bonus show planned for you. If you think the show ends at the top of the hour, it doesn't. There's a whole other show which Lewis produces and hosts. Today we'll talk about the high salaries of some San Francisco first responders. We'll also talk about Obama and Romney condoms. Has Lewis put in a bulk order? If so, is it for just the Obama condoms? Is it just the Romney condoms? Is it both? How will he decide? Et cetera. DavidPakman.com slash membership. Get the bonus show. It's the best way to support the show. We'll be right back after this. Stay tuned. The David Pakman Show at DavidPakman.com. Welcome back to The David Pakman Show. Please do all of your Amazon.com shopping through the black banner at davidpakman.com. Click it, bookmark it, use it every time you shop. You'll redirect a portion of your purchase away from Amazon and toward supporting independent media. You can also become a David Pakman Show member, made possible in part by liberalbias.com. The more you look for it, the more you find liberal bias. Liberal bias is everywhere. You can find out more at liberalbias.com. Today is a very special new member announcement, Lewis. Today's new member is, as far as I know, the first Utah-based David Pakman Show member, Danny Hartman. Utah, of course, known for Mormons, known for skiing, known for, I don't know, known for Danny Hartman being the first Utah-based David Pakman Show member. So thanks to Danny 
and uh, we love Utah. We, we accept members from, forget about any state, we accept members from any country. Yeah, it's, it's an international thing we have going on here. No question about it. Utah's great though. I hear they have a nice big lake somewhere over there. Love it. All right. Okay, we had this incredible story about Jeffrey Johnson showing up near the Empire State Building in New York City and killing his former boss, Steve Corlino. He tried to escape on foot down West 33rd Street and construction workers al uh, alerted nearby police who gave chase. Now, we don't have to get into the, the, all of the details surrounding the story. Very quickly, it was ruled out that this was any kind of terrorism or, or, or any kind of political killing. Literally, this was a guy who was angry with his former boss and he went down there and, uh, and he killed him. And New York City Mayor Michael Bloomberg came out pretty quickly, praised the New York City Police Department for stopping the shooter, Jeffrey Johnson. Uh, he was shot dead by the police. He alluded to the possibility that some of the injured may have been shot by police. I don't know how much of that press conference you saw, Lewis. Uh, I did not see any of it, actually. Very good. Now, Michael Bloomberg, before we get to this accidental shooting thing, he also said at the end of his speech, once again, there's an awful lot of guns out there. Now, this was something that many people expected because Michael Bloomberg is one of these mayors against illegal guns. He's part of that organization, and he has been very, very outspoken about what he thinks is a serious gun problem. He included that pro-gun rights groups didn't like that. Fine. Nothing really to discuss there. We, I think it's great that he included that in there. He is not going to be pushed around uh, by these groups. And, and when he sees a shooting like this and he says, there's just a lot of guns out there. If there were less guns out there, it would at least have been somewhat more difficult for the shooter to get this gun and kill this person. Is that correct? I believe it is. I mean, to an extent. I mean... As a strictly the, the, the mathematical amount... thing. Yes, but... If but... you know less people with guns, legal or illegal your resources for where to get a gun illegally are going to, to decrease. It's just a mathematical thing. Will it eliminate every shooting? No, it won't, and I'm not saying that it will. But you can't ignore the strict math of it. Yes, but if you're desperate enough, I'm sure he would have found a way to get a gun. It's, it's possible. Driving to another state, maybe, even, even going that far. Well, but the that... amount of work you'd have to do and legislation you'd have to pass to make sure that no lunatic who wants to shoot up a building can get his hands on a gun would be huge. It's all about numbers, and it's not about eliminating every single opportunity, but it's about reducing the, the number of these incidents. But that's not really what I want to talk about. What I want to talk about is something else. The comment about some people, some of those victims, may have been inadvertently shot by New York City police. It turns out, we actually heard from Commissioner, uh, New York City Police Commissioner Ray Kelly, that police wounded all nine of the injured bystanders with bullets when they were shooting at Johnson. He said police officers had a gun right in their face. They responded quickly. They responded appropriately. And having looked at the tape himself, he believes the officers had no choice. It's just a little bit strange to me. And I'm going to play some video here for you, which I warn you may be somewhat disturbing. Um, it's, it, I, I, I wonder, does, does it make sense for all nine of the people that were wounded to have been wounded by police Guns? I don't know. Let's take a look at a little bit of this video here. Um, and as you can see, we have the man kind of coming down the middle of the screen there, trying to escape, and police are coming after him. And as you can see, there he is. They shoot him numerous times, and he falls to the ground, drops his briefcase. That is audio, uh, video courtesy of uh, Reuters there. So, I don't know. You know, what can we really say? This isn't about second guessing police at every instance. This isn't about saying first responders are evil. This isn't about any of those things. It's not about calling for anyone's firing. It just, I'm, I'm shocked given the, the firearms training that I thought police had that you have nine accidental bystander injuries and all nine of those came from police, not from the actual shooter. What's your reaction? Um... I, I don't think the training is that extensive when it comes to firearm practice. I mean, as far as I understand, there's at least one test you have to pass with a firearm when you become a police officer, when you're issued that weapon. I don't know how often you have to do that. And this I, may vary state by state. Yeah, and I think, generally speaking, it's up to the in individual to make sure they are as accurate as possible on their own time um, with their weapons. Do you think that, it, is this concerning, that not in... in in trying to get one guy that nine other people were shot by police, not by the shooter. Um, that's, it's, it's pretty insane. Yeah, that, that is not good news. Natan, what do you think? 
Yeah, and that's why I think that in this particular case, the gun control argument is is less of an issue than it is in some other shootings. And I think that we need to look at you know, what happened with the police here. Yeah, I mean, it also, so looking back at this video, the man who drops the briefcase was the shooter. Okay, the other cop was about five feet from that guy. Um, couldn't he have just used a taser on him? Well, I don't know. What we have to assume is that there was more distance between them earlier in the chase. And at yeah. that point is when shots were being fired that went astray. So shots people. were fired. Were shots fired at the police by him? Uh, he, I, that's not clear. I don't know that. I know that he had a gun yeah. and he was waving it. Right. He seemed to be just running away in right. most of the video we saw. We don't because know that. Because if he wasn't firing it at the police, I, I don't know why they would go on a shooting rampage. A lot of things we can't assume here. Okay. Well, we need more information. We need more information. I, I, I don't Absolutely. know. But, but not, I mean, it's, it's unacceptable. To, I mean, to have nine people wounded, I would say it's, it's pretty lucky that none of them were killed. I think so, too. Yeah. Frank Zabo is a New Hampshire Republican who's running for county sheriff. He's comparing abortion to slavery, and he is saying that he would use deadly force on a surgeon to prevent a abortion from taking place. What? What is this guy talking about? Let's look at the video. Let's hear the audio. You're going to need to hear it for yourself to believe the lunacy here. Well, if it's an elective abortion, um, absolutely that is murder in my opinion. Hillsborough County Sheriff's candidate Frank Zabo is controversial enough for saying he'd arrest any doctor who performs legal elective abortions in New Hampshire. But now he says he wouldn't rule out the use of deadly force to keep it from happening. You would do whatever it took to stop that from happening? Absolutely. Deadly Absolutely. force. Well, I would hope that it wouldn't come to that as with any situation where someone is in danger. But again, specifically talking about elective abortions and late-term abortions, uh, that is an act that needs to be stopped. Wow. What do you think? I think uh, I think if he tried to do any of this, he would face serious legal trouble. Yeah. How do you run for for a law enforcement office when you openly say you're going to do an illegal thing? Yeah. I mean, uh, f let's well, I don't even know where to start. As if he's here. a lawmaker. Yeah. First of all, first of all, legally. Arresting someone for performing an abortion, a legal surgical procedure, a legal surgical procedure is no different than, for example, if you had a anti antibiotic point of view because you're a Christian scientist and you were to say, I'm now the sheriff. I'm going to arrest every doctor that's prescribing antibiotics because you know what? Uh, that's you just can't do that. That's wrong. My religion says it's wrong the same way that Frank Zabo's uh, religion tells him that it's wrong. So that's number one. But number two, we're reaching new lows here because we have a, a purported law enforcement official indicating he's going to break the law because of something that other people are doing, which is legal, in order to stop them from doing that. What, what's going on here? And by the way, isn't New Hampshire the live free or die state? Is killing someone to promote your political and religious opinions acceptable in the live free or die state? Well, what about, the, uh, what about that unborn baby? The unborn baby has freedoms too, David. Yeah, until he's born. And then obviously the Republicans don't care at all about him. Does this guy have a shot in New Hampshire? I don't. I haven't seen any polls about this race. I would hope. I would be horrified. Or is this, this just, is this just a, a random nut and just a, a shock story? Just... My understanding is that this is a legitimate candidate. That being said, I don't know how he's doing in the polls. But it is not like, for example, when the, what was the, the rent is too damn high guy was running for, oh, yeah. I, don't, which, I don't even remember which party he was in. I think he was on the Republican side, right? Yeah, he was. Yeah. Uh, it's not like that. It's more, it, he's more legitimate than that. Now, the question is, are these comments legitimate or are they illegitimate comments? Because the reason I bring that up is if his killing people who are performing abortions is illegitimate, then the body, it can shut the whole thing down and then it's fine. Nothing happens. Right. Right. Um, <laughs> <laughs> go figure. Yeah. I mean, why can't someone who, I mean, why can't bodies just shut down abortion attempts? You know, maybe there's a way to do that. Listen, ladies and gentlemen, Lewis, you've just come across. I, I can't believe. Why didn't I think of this before? If abortion is not a, if, if abortion is legitimately murder, the woman's body shuts the whole thing down and yeah. the baby stays alive. And abortions is born. don't even exist by that logic. By that logic, there's no such thing as an abortion. Hmm. Fascinating. What, what are we worrying about here? The body shuts the whole thing down. Trust me, the Nazis did some experiments on it, and it's true. It works. See, this guy doesn't even need to run anymore. Why? Why run? It's yeah. crazy. Michigan police shot a homeless man, known to be mentally ill, named Milton Hall, 46 times. That's a high estimate. The low estimate 
according to people who have analyzed the videotape, including a number of media outlets, is 30 times. Now, we talk about, well, if you go, if you go hunting, one of the reasons you need to have a 30-round clip is if a huge bear attacks you, you might need up to 30 bullets. So if you might need 30 for a bear, why do you need 46 for a mentally ill man? That's, that's a question. Let's take a look at some of this video. This is a man who was well known in Saginaw, Michigan. Uh, family lived there, mentally ill. Police say he was known to be an assaultive person with a long history of contacts with law enforcement. The record shows he has an arrest record only for minor offenses, things like vagrancy. That's code for being poor, ladies and gentlemen. Shot between 30 and 46 times. Let's look at the video. Let's listen to the audio. I guess I wouldn't be doing uh, my job if I didn't say that some people may find the video disturbing. Let's take a look. This amateur video, purchased by CNN and not made public until now, captured the confrontation between six Saginaw police officers and Milton Hall, a 49-year-old man who his family says suffered from serious mental health issues. Hall, seen in the middle of your screen, police say, had just had a run-in with a convenience store clerk. He was in a standoff with police and holding some sort of knife. A female officer is heard shouting. If you listen carefully, Paul is then heard continuing to yell at police. Paul seems agitated, but not intimidated by a police dog. Heard on the tape, a witness describes what he sees. Yeah, the karate stands about to go ham on him. Then, as Hall appears to take a few steps, everything comes to a head. What is going on? Okay, I mean, let's, let's assume he has a knife, which he does. Let's assume that he is attacking police officers. Let's assume all this stuff. Why do you shoot him so many times? I, I don't even want to get into whether this guy deserved to die or not because I believe that he didn't. He was mentally ill. He had a knife. It was a very clear-cut situation that the police just didn't seem to have even the slightest social service training to handle. But why shoot him between 30 and 46 times? That really, to me, represents some escalated amount of paranoia or aggression, I just don't understand it. I'm not being critical. I just can't imagine what would precipitate shooting the man 30 to 46 times. And if he didn't have that knife to someone's throat, and if he just was standing there with a knife surrounded by cops, uh, why couldn't they just uh, also use a taser in that situation? Why couldn't they taser? Why couldn't they uh, uh, send a dog? I mean, they had a dog. I just don't understand it, ladies and gentlemen. I just don't get it. I have to question whether we're training police in the best way. We know their training with the mentally ill isn't that great. But maybe their training with guns isn't that great either. Because when, why 30 to 46 shots? It's a very sad state of affairs, Lewis. Maybe things are just being done cheaply and inefficiently or... The cheaper way would the, be to save the bullets, let me tell you. Those, they have gone up in price quite a bit. All right, let's take a break. Facebook.com slash David Pakman Show. Hi to everybody from the We Survive Bush, You Will Survive Obama Facebook page. Joining us on the live stream and everybody from the Young Turks. We'll take a break. Wendell Potter coming up next. Great, great interview with him. Stay tuned. The David Pakman Show at davidpakman.com. Welcome back to The David Pakman Show. Wendell Potter is with us. He is former VP of Corporate Communications at Cigna, also author of the book Deadly Spin, and senior analyst at the Center for Public Integrity. Wendell, always great as always to talk to you. We've been seeing so much ever since uh, Paul Ryan was uh, deemed the VP running mate for Mitt, Ryan, uh, Mitt Romney about this issue of Medicare cuts. Uh, initially, the, the claim was, well, look, Paul Ryan is not good for seniors. He's essentially going to destroy Medicare. And the kind of uh, uh, counter to that from the right wing has been, listen, President Obama also is stripping $700 billion from Medicare through the Affordable Care Act, so it's all the same thing. Let's start right there. Is it the same thing? Are there differences? What of that is true? What of it is not true? 
Oh, they're very, very different approaches. Um, and it's very disingenuous to call these, what the president is doing with the Affordable Care Act, cuts to Medicare. It's actually not that at all. What the Affordable Care Act does over 10 years, it reduces payments to health care providers and insurance companies, uh, and that's a very good thing. In fact, uh, uh, the hospitals and uh, doctors uh, that have been involved in this, have looked at this and actually enforced it uh, as the health care reform debate was going on, because they know that if you bring more people into coverage and these reductions in, in uh, payments to these providers will help finance the expansion of coverage to bring more people into coverage. That means that there will be, le be less uncompensated care, less bad debt that hospitals have to, uh, uh, have to carry. So it's not any cuts. In fact, the Affordable Care Act adds to benefit health care uh, beneficiaries or Medicare beneficiaries. It covers preventive care for the first time, uh, important screenings like uh, cancer screenings, and it also uh, begins to close that donut hole so people will, uh, have to, will not have to spend so much out of their own pockets uh, for their medications. So it is uh, very disingenuous. The Affordable Care Act helps uh, seniors and it strengthens the Medicare program by reducing spending over 10 years. Okay, now when we look at the Ryan budget, those same 700 billion supposedly that, that are being pointed to, there we are actually really seeing a reduction in the benefits that eventually get to seniors. Well, what Ryan is doing, not only is he uh, saying that those reductions in payments will go forward. We're also saying that what we're, what he wants to do uh, is to fundamentally restructure the Medicare plan, Medicare program, uh, and replace it with, for all practical purposes, a voucher program in which the government would give uh, Medicare beneficiaries a certain amount of money every year to go out on the private market and buy private health insurance, uh, which is a very, very bad thing in my view for senior citizens because uh, it essentially is privatizing Medicare, turning it over to private insurance companies, the very companies I used to work for and left largely in disgust because of just how they do business and how inefficient they are and how much they've over many years ripped the government off and ripped beneficiaries off. The last thing in the world we want to do is turn uh, the Medicare program over, over to these private insurance companies. I want to touch a little bit on something that wasn't yet decided the last time you were on the program. We, we, last time you were on, we didn't yet have a decision from the Supreme Court about the constitutionality of the Affordable Care Act. Now that we've seen that, I'm interested to get your thoughts on this idea. We're still hearing from some circles that this is some kind of socialist or communist health care plan. My reading of it is this is mandating that the private insurers have more customers. I've never heard of a socialist program that gives private companies a ton more customers. That just doesn't make sense to me, yet we're still seeing that idea out there. We're still seeing that because some people will believe whatever they're told. Uh, they're, 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 they will go to places to get their information or misinformation, as it usually is when it comes to the Affordable Care Act, uh, from people who have an agenda, an agenda to misinform them. Uh, and often, if they, you can trace back the, this misinformation to a lot of the special interests that uh, have tried to influence the, the, the law and the way it's implemented, in particular my former industry. But you're exactly right. Uh, the way it's structured, uh, it does uh, represent a new revenue stream for private insurance companies. It is, the, it is the farthest away from socialized medicine that you could possibly get. Uh, it, is, uh, uh, it gives the private insurance industry uh, new lease on life, if you will. Their business models otherwise would be simply not sustainable. But because they are so powerful and influential in Washington, uh, congressional Democrats and the president felt we had to or they had to work with the existing system and try to uh, make it better and try to fix some of the problems with it rather than just throwing the whole thing out and starting over. One of my main concerns about the Affordable Care Act, for all of the good things that it does, is that it, because it does give so many new customers to the for-profit healthcare model, that it will actually, in the long run, make it more difficult to actually move away from the for-profit, uh, uh, employer-centered insurance plan and towards something like what Vermont is proposing to do. Is that a reasonable concern? In other words, the fact that now there are even more people in that for-profit system? You know, what I think can happen, and I'm hoping will happen, uh, if the restrictions, if the new regulations on 
uh, insurance companies continues to go forward, and I, I trust that it will, then then their profit margins will be squeezed. And I've seen over the over the course of my time in the industry, uh, when these companies are not making what Wall Street analysts and investors expect of them, uh, they'll tell them to get in a new line of business. I've seen the insurance industry change radically in the 20 years that I was a part of it. And I think we'll, we'll see it evolving. I'm hopeful that the profit companies will be squeezed so much uh, that the for-profit companies will say, this is not where we can make the most money and move on to do some other things and essentially leave the marketplace uh, to either non-profit or co-ops or uh, something else that would replace uh, the stranglehold that the insurance industry has on our system. I think it's entirely possible. And I do think also that uh, uh, the Affordable Care Act does allow states to go beyond and do other things, as you mentioned, Vermont. Uh, and Vermont is moving toward a single-payer system. If it can succeed, I think other states will, will, will pay attention and, uh, and follow suit. And we have to assume that even though Vermont, because of its low population, is not the big profit center for most for-profit insurers, there has to be fear that if it goes well in Vermont, it will now be looked at as precedent to look to do it in bigger states. You're exactly right. Even though the big for-profit companies don't have a big presence in Vermont, uh, they're watching it very carefully, and they would like nothing more than to derail that effort. And I'm confident that they're already pouring money into front groups in the state to try to uh, generate fear of what's going on there, to get people to second guess their decisions to move forward toward a single payer. So that's exactly what I think will happen, but uh, Vermont's a different kind of state, uh, uh, and it may just be able to pull this off. Uh, the governor is fully supportive of it, the, the legislature is still controlled by, by Democrats who voted in large numbers to move forward, uh, and there are a lot of, of people at the grassroots level who are very active in supporting this. So. Uh, despite the opposition from the insurance industry, I think Vermont has a very good chance of pulling this off. The problem is, it'll take a few years. They can't just do it next year. Uh, it has to be phased in. The Affordable Care Act, while I said it allows states to, to go beyond, uh, it only doesn't allow them to do much more until 2017, after most of the Affordable Care Act is already in place. But it does give states flexibility. All right, and we'll be watching that very, very closely, as well as the front groups, which you describe in great detail in the book, Deadly Spin. We've been speaking with Wendell Potter, senior analyst at the Center for Public Integrity, also former VP of Corporate Communications at Cigna. Pleasure as always, Wendell. Thank you. Thank you, David. The David Pakman Show at davidpakman.com. The David Pakman Show at davidpakman.com. The best way to support The David Pakman Show is become a David Pakman Show member. We're talking about pennies a day. You get a bunch of great benefits. Find out more at davidpakman.com slash membership. Fox News outed a Navy SEAL, specifically a Navy SEAL who wrote about the raid that killed Osama bin Laden. Now, what do you mean outed? Well, he wrote it under a pseudonym, and he was outed by Fox News as his real name, Matt Bissonette, okay? This is very, very weird. The book was called, is called No Easy Day. It's scheduled to be released on September 11th under the pseudonym Mark Owen, okay? Now, Penguin Group, which is Dutton, uh, Penguin Group's USA's Dutton imprint, which is the publisher, asked news organizations, don't say who this is. Don't talk about uh, Matt Bissonette. Talk about Mark Owen. Well, what does Fox News do? What does Fox News do? who loves the troops, supports the troops, loves Republicans, loves killing bin Laden, although maybe slightly less so because it was Obama who was president when it happened. Here's what they said. They ignored that request from the publisher and just outed the guy. Here we go. We are now learning the identity of a former Navy SEAL who was one of the first through Osama bin Laden's door the night he was taken out and whose upcoming book, by the way, on that mission aims to, quote, set the record straight about one of the most important missions in U.S. military history. As you can imagine, there is reaction to the Pentagon and all this, and our national security correspondent Jennifer Griffin has more on that at the Pentagon. Good morning, Jennifer. 
Good morning, Bill. Fox News has learned the identity of a former Navy SEAL Team, team 6 member who anonymously co-authored No Easy Day, the first-hand account of the mission that killed Osama bin Laden, a book that's set to hit the shelves on September 11th. Known until now only as Mark Owen, the pseudonym under which he wrote the book, Fox News has now learned that his name is, in fact, Matt Bissonnette, 36, age 36, of Wrangell, Alaska. He graduated. There you go. Great job, Fox News. You guys are doing such great investigative reporting for outing this guy. Now there are obvious risks to this individual's personal security. There are now risks to other, other people he's associated with who, of course, could also have been part of Navy SEAL Team 6. Isn't this a national security issue? Shouldn't Fox News be investigated for causing a national security issue to armed service members? Um, like that's going to happen. I thought Fox loved America. I thought they loved the troops. What's going on? Good question. I don't know. Doesn't make any sense, does it? Maybe they love ratings just a little bit more, but uh, <laughs> I don't even see how how outing this guy is, Would even is help a the big ratings. story. How's it even a big story? I mean, the book is the story here. Who cares what the guy's name is? It's very bizarre, and I have no idea why Fox News would do something like this. Real quick before we get to voicemails, Neil Armstrong passed away at age 82 over the weekend, the first person to walk on the moon, a known test pilot before uh, being an astronaut. NBC News was the first to report it, but they reported that astronaut Neil Young had passed away. Now, of course, rocker Neil Young is perfectly alive. Kind of a weird thing to report. Interesting thing about Neil Armstrong is, of course, the entire controversy over there's one step. That's, uh, that's, <laughs> that's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Apparently, the actual uh, uh, comment was supposed to be, that's one small step for a man one giant leap for mankind because saying that's one small step for man is kind of the same as mankind he didn't right. think grammatically it made sense interesting a astronauts having very good grammatical sense here is the actual audio of what he said eventually armstrong did say sounds like i didn't really say a man i messed it up i forgot the word let's take a listen that's one small step for man one now let's listen to it one more time. There is a bit of static where you would hear a man, which was kind of what Neil Armstrong and many others were pointing to for many years, eventually saying, I forgot the word. Here it is. That's one small step for man. You hear that? There's that little static right when he says man, where maybe there was an eye in there. What do you think, Natan? Yeah, I think it's possible that there was an eye, but either way, um, the act was more important than... Uh, the missing uh. Absolutely. Yeah. So uh, uh, condolences to everybody involved. I was very sorry to hear about his passing. A very interesting guy. And of course, what he accomplished. Incredible. Uh, yeah. I mean, no one else can say that they were the first man on the moon, can they? And many people say he still can't say it because they think it was staged. But that's a story for a show on conspiracy theories. Yes. Let's get to some of your voicemails real quick. 2192 David P. Leave us voicemail 24 hours a day. Here's one. Hey, David, Lewis, and Natan. This is Bill from Pennsylvania. I love your show. I'm calling in today just to let you guys know that you missed one of the rock bands that could still be played at Ryan Romney rallies, and that band is Megadeth. Uh, you guys remember that Dave Mustaine has come out uh, strongly for Romney and also implying that Obama... Uh, stage the Aurora shootings. So. Right. So we actually, when we were talking about that last week, we did forget, of course, to include Dave Mustaine and Megadeth as what can't do uh, Twisted Sister, can't do Rage Against the Machine, but Megadeth on the table. Not sure if Romney fans are going to like that style of music, but uh, yeah. yeah. Okay. And real quick, here is a voicemail from an audience member in Sweden. Hey, David. Hey, Louis. I'd just like to say thanks for the show. It's been really good. I've watched you guys for about a year now. been a member for almost that long. Uh, yeah, I really like where the show is going, and uh, I guess that's about it. I really like that uh, you're involving uh, Guatama a bit more. That's, uh, <laughs> that's good. Uh, and yeah, I guess that's about it. Thanks. Okay, so again, brilliant voicemail, because I don't know if he's joking about the often misunderstood TV director Natan, or whether he is one of those who misunderstands his name as Guatam. I don't know. I don't know what I think it is. he's in on the joke. I think it's part of the joke. All right, we'll see you tomorrow or on the bonus show if you remember. The David Pakman Show at davidpakman.com.